it's an absolute pleasure to speak at the Polyglot Conference. This is actually the first time I've spoken at the Polyglot Conference since 2014. So it's been about a four year break for me, but it's nice to be back and it's nice to see so many new faces as always, filling the hall, coming in even now. It's absolutely wonderful. I think one of the things that I love most about the Polyglot Conference and why it's such an honor for me to be involved in the organization is that I think it addresses an issue that very few other events can, which is what do we do with people like us? People who learn languages for no real reason. People whose parents are constantly saying, what, you're learning another one? People whose colleagues are going, no, you can't possibly speak all of those languages. It's ridiculous. Your LinkedIn is absolutely insane. What do we do about people like us who sort of have, well, I mean, I don't know about you guys, so I'll just speak about me. I have a problem. I like learning languages quite a lot, and I don't know where to stop. And the problem I've always had is getting recognition for the fact that my hobby is normal, useful, or even possible. So what I love most about this event is that we get to come together with people who don't ask those questions, who understand all the same things, and as a result, we get to have some wonderful discussions. For me, the Polyglot Conference is a place to share ideas, to share ideas and to share experiences. And just spending these two or three days together means that we all go home with completely new perspectives on what we all know and love. Now, the types of talks we have at the Polyglot Conference vary immensely, but I'd say if I had to summarize them, I'd do so with three question words. The first question word that I'd use would be what. A lot of talks are specifically about language. They're about the language that we learn. What is that language? What is the linguistics? What is the grammar? The other question word that I'd use is how. How do we learn languages? What are the best methods? What are the best approaches, etc., etc. If I was to summarize this talk in one word, it would be why. I'm going to talk to you today about why I like learning languages, why I feel so passionate about it, and why I'm delighted to have a hobby that I think makes my world a richer place and that I think I will never grow tired of. So I'm going to tell you a story, basically, and the story is essentially about me. It's my personal story. And at the end of this um, presentation, I'd be delighted to hear your story as well. I'd love to hear your comments and I'd love you to tell me what you recognize and what you didn't recognize about my story. But before we go into that, this is just a little bit about me. So I have always learned languages as a hobby and I also studied them at school and at university. And uh, at university I studied German and beginner's Russian, which meant that I had to go to Russia for a year to live amongst the snow and uh, learn to speak proper Russian. Now, the thought of going off to Russia, a country I'd never been to, where I would be far away from my parents, was fairly terrifying for a 19-year-old like me at the time. So I spent some time on the internet looking for advice about how to get the best out of my year abroad. And I found a website called thirdyearabroad.com where this pop-up came up that said, are you or do you know Britain's most multilingual student? Because if you do, or you are, you could win an iPad. So I signed up heard nothing, and then three months later, had an interview with 11 people from 11 countries about all sorts of bizarre topics, and they said, well, congratulations, you're Britain's most multilingual student. And I said, okay, what happens now? And what happened next was this video in the top left of me appearing and disappearing behind trees in the freezing cold, speaking multiple languages. Um, so that was kind of a big change for me. This was a lot of attention about people speaking languages, and uh, for me it was even baffling that anyone was remotely interested that someone like me would be learning languages. But it changed my life, and ever since then languages have been an integral part of my life. Um, I now work as a writer and a journalist, and I've written two books here on the left. The first was How to Speak Any Language Fluently that came out last year, which was some techniques about how to learn languages. And the second most recent one, from Amaret to Jal, Bizarre and Beautiful Words from Around Europe, for when English just won't do, is an attempt to try to show people who don't know languages what it's like to know them, to be able to play with them and to experience the nuance. But we'll talk about that a bit later. 
Um, for the last two years, I worked at Memrise, where, um, which is represented today. Some of my lovely colleagues, just see them walking in. There they are, looking slightly tired from last night, presumably. Um, where one of my jobs was really to help define the pedagogical approach that we take at Memrise and the way that we think about languages and also to design the new courses that are now live in the app. Here's a screenshot from some of the videos we shot in Paris where we just went around places interviewing funky looking people and asking them to say phrases in Paris, in French rather. Um, I've also worked as a course creator for Mango Languages. I was the editor on their intermediate Greek course and I was also the main contributor to Afrikaans Pod 101. And um, the other thing I do is I actually talk. I give talks, I attend events to represent multilingual people worldwide. And this is a little picture of me taking part in a debate at the European Commission three years ago in Brussels for the European Day of Languages. So that's me. But we're not really just here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the title, which is Languages for a World Without Grenzen. And uh, a month ago, when I tried to give a talk under a similar name in Brussels, the organizers said, oh, you can't possibly have the word Grenzen in the title. We have to translate it into French, otherwise no one will come. And I said, no, we simply cannot have for a world without frontières. And I'll explain why. Why Grenzen? The man on the right-hand side is Ludwig Wittgenstein. He is an Austrian-British philosopher who split his time in his life between Vienna and London. And I think it was my father, actually, who first told me about him, because he told me that he said something that had really affected him. The limits of my language are the limits of my world. I've always stayed with this thought. The limits of my language are the limits of my world. It's a lovely quote. It sounds lovely in English. But the word limits always caused me a bit of a problem. What is a limit? A speed limit? I don't know. Nonetheless, I didn't think about it too much, and my father is not um, a polyglot. He doesn't speak German, so he would always tell me that quote in English. But then fairly recently, I thought, actually, I should have a look at the quote in German. Die Grenzen meiner Sprache bedeuten die Grenzen meiner Welt. And I was amazed to see that actually the word limit in English had come from the word Grenzen in German. And of course, sometimes Grenzen can mean limit, but of course, Grenzen means something very different as well. So I suggest that we translate it like this. The borders of my language denote the borders of my world, because that word Grenzen is very, very important. But the fact is that we don't talk about it like this in English. We say limits, and I've always wondered why. We're talking about these white things along the map. These are Grenzen, these are borders. These things have defined life in Europe for centuries. But of course, where I come from, which is um, that island just off the coast of Europe called Britain, we don't really think about Grenzen a lot. In fact, we don't really have borders in this country. We are an island. We thought we didn't have borders at all until fairly recently when the European Union asked, what are we going to do about the Irish border? And we said, what Irish border? And they said, yeah, this border you have with Ireland, what are you going to do when you leave the European Union? And we all went, oh yeah, we have a land border. I thought we just had Dover. <laughs> but the fact is that even this land border that we have with Ireland is far more open than most borders that you have in Europe. This is it. There's nothing to tell you you're going into another country. There's just a sign to remind you that you are now leaving one of the three major countries in the world that use miles and going back into the sanity of the rest of the world, the Republic of Ireland. The United States and Myanmar are the only other countries in the world, major countries, that use miles, just for your information. So maybe if we had the quote, the borders of my language are the borders of my world in English, it just wouldn't have the same effect as the word Grenzen because we just don't have that same relationship with the concept of borders. But if we look at Europe and particularly at the German speaking world in the middle there, look at how borders define life. Everywhere you go, you are confronted with borders. Everywhere you go, you are confronted with fairly artificial lines which cause nothing but inconvenience to your life. And think about the poor people of the village of Schengen, who until relatively recently found themselves between France and, G and Germany, but in Luxembourg, and had to show their passport practically every time they crossed the road to buy a pint of milk. 
The fact is that nowadays, I'm delighted to say that we live in a Europe without these problems. We live in a Europe without borders that are open. The people of Schengen are free to cross the river into France or Germany as they please, without checks, without inconvenience, and without having to show expensive documentation. This is a freedom that we simply do not understand in Britain because we are an island. And that makes me think again to the, 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 the Wittgenstein quote that we talked about before. The borders of my language are the borders of my world. Die Grenzen meiner Sprache bedeuten die Grenzen meiner Welt. And really, wouldn't it be much better if we all lived in a world without borders, where we could travel much more freely? I would love to live in a Europe, and in fact, we do now live in a Europe, but I think it's worth reminding ourselves. We live in a Europe where people, culture, and ideas can travel freely from place to place, and as naturally as birds flying from tree to tree. I believe that makes us all richer, and I believe that I am the person I am today because of the freedom of movement that brought so many people to my country so that I could learn from them, grow up with them, and count them as friends. It's worth talking about it because those freedoms are currently under threat. But of course, these are the grenzen, the physical grenzen that go down our country, but there's more than that. There are also grenzen of the mind. Now, I'll tell you a little story about when I was growing up. So I grew up in the UK, and um, this is not the UK. And um, I grew up to a half-Greek mother and an English father, and my half-Greek mother was born in England just after the war, at a time when it wasn't exactly popular to be a foreigner. Um, in fact, when my grandmother moved into their house in North London, within a week, the police were called because there was a foreigner living on the street to check her papers. When my mother went to school, she wasn't even really able to speak English that well because her father was working the whole time and she was basically just learning Greek from her mother, which meant that she was bullied and often kind of made to feel quite uncomfortable in the place where she was born. As a result, she decided that she didn't want to speak Greek, she just wanted to speak English so she could fit in. She quickly realized that this was a huge mistake, that she was giving up a huge part of her identity and then eventually she moved to Greece for 15 years, taught there, lived there, learned the language, and then when she returned to England and I was born, she was determined that I wouldn't make the same mistake that she had. But of course I did. This is a visual representation of my childhood in the United Kingdom. I don't know why you're applauding. Here we are in the car. It's raining. We're traveling the endless distances of London from one after-school activity to another. And this was when my mother tried her most to put the Greek into my mind. I was trapped in a seat with a seatbelt and a locked door. I could not escape. She would sit there and go, Kitaxe Alexandre, Kitaxe to Fanari, Bosuine Kokino, look at the traffic lights, it's red, look at the pedestrian. I mean, at the age of six, my traffic vocabulary in Greek was pretty advanced <laughs> as a result of this experience. But to my mother's dismay, I never replied in Greek at all. I just replied in English. So she tried to get my uncles involved to speak to me in Greek as well, but of course, I'd just reply in English, and they'd reply in Greek. It was like a bizarre game. I was saying to my mum, why are you doing this? Why are you trying to speak this bizarre language? Everyone around me speaks English, and we have absolutely no need for this. But of course, she didn't lose hope, and she came up with a rather cunning plan. One summer, she decided to exile me to this ghastly place behind me. This place is Leonidio in the south of Greece. It's a lovely, undiscovered place. Don't go there, please. We don't need tourists. <laughs> Forget I mentioned it. But when I was about eight, we spent an entire summer here, me and my parents, and it was absolute hell. I had no one to talk to. Everyone around me, there were kids who were playing, who were having fun, but I couldn't talk to them because I couldn't speak Greek. So my mum said, well, now you're screwed, aren't you? <laughs> you can either spend an entire summer sitting next to me, or you can get your Greek on and you can go off and try and make some friends. So of course I resisted this for a while, but then eventually the, the difference between the way in which the local kids were enjoying the place, running around, having fun, basking in the sunshine while I sat with my mum reading a book, 
was too uh, convincing. And eventually I went over and I did try to speak some Greek. And before I knew it, by the end of that summer, I was actually speaking. And suddenly I understood what this whole language thing was about. First of all, what you needed in order to learn another language was a real need. When I was in London, let's just remind ourselves what that looks like. When I was in London, there was no need to speak Greek. Everybody who spoke Greek there spoke English. When I was exiled to here, there was a real need to speak Greek, and it was tangible. Either I learned this language and have a really great summer, or I spent the whole thing with my mother. And that was actually the, definitely the best summer of my life, the summer that definitely changed my life. Running around, playing in the olive groves, fishing, playing cards on the beach until late. It was absolutely wonderful. And this was the summer that I really discovered language. Because, of course, Greece is not just full of Greeks. Tourists travel there from all over the world, and so it wasn't just Greek that I needed to speak, but also I met people from Germany, from Austria, from the Netherlands, from France, and we were all at that very special age before people really start to learn English at school, so we had no way to talk other than to exchange our languages and to share them. And that summer I realized, wouldn't it be wonderful if instead of being divided by language all over the world, we could use languages to come together? Wouldn't it be wonderful one day to be able to speak every language in the world and to be able to speak to anyone and befriend anyone um, using their language and based on your interests? It was a dream that stayed with me for a very long time. However, I wasn't the only English person in Leonidio that summer. There were other English people too. There was a girl called Amy who I befriended who was there with her family. And, um, the Greeks knew Amy, a lot of the kids that I become friends with, they worked at the hotel, they worked at the restaurant, and I said to them, what do you guys think of Amy? And they said, oh, they're very strange. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, they eat very strange things. Like, for example, they have this fixation about having a starter before every single meal, and then the things they order are absolutely bizarre. The other day, one of them ordered tzatziki and had the whole bowl to herself and then had an entire steak. How weird. Because, of course, in Greece, it's not how you eat. You just put food on the table, and everyone takes a bit, and you share, and then more food comes, and more food comes until you physically cannot eat anymore. But in England, you need that structure. And the Greeks found it very, very strange. And the other thing that they didn't really understand about Amy and her family were the fact that there they were on the beach, but they weren't in the sea. They were sitting on the sand reading books. And now in Greek, I mean, this is probably fair to say that in Greece, there's not a huge culture of reading at the moment. And one of the interesting things about the Greek language is that the word for to read and the word for this to study are almost the same. You'd say diavazo for both. And if you tell someone diavazo dora, they wouldn't necessarily know whether you mean you're reading for pleasure or you're studying for an exam. So the Greek kids simply couldn't understand why these people had come on holiday and were lying on the sand and studying. A bit of cultural difference. But of course, when I talked to Amy and her family, they said the similar things. Their impressions of Greeks were this. The Greeks are rude. They're always shouting at us. The Greeks are loud. They're always shouting at each other. The Greeks are lazy. They're just lying around all the time. They eat weird food, like that strange yogurt thing we had the other day. The Greeks are not very good at English. And of course, Greece is very hot. But it's probably fair to say that we could summarize the Greeks' impressions of Amy's family as this. British people are rude. They're always shouting at us. British people are loud, especially when they get drunk in the evenings and shout at each other. They're lazy. They lie on the beach all day. What are they doing? Why don't they ever do anything else? We have so much to see in this country, and they just lie there on the sand. They eat very funny food. We heard about that. British people are not very good at Greek. That was true. And British people spend far too long in the sun. So I think you kind of see what I'm getting at here, right? There was a divide between these people. There was essentially a grenze between Amy's family, who were in holiday, in, on holiday in Greece, enjoying themselves, and the Greeks that lived there. And the fact is that for some reason, they just couldn't get to know each other. They just couldn't get to a point where they could understand where the other person was coming from. And my theory about that is this. Amy's family, everywhere they went, just spoke English. They expected people to be able to speak English back. And when they did speak English back, they weren't very impressed with the English that they received. Because simply, you know, I mean, we have to understand this. Us English speakers, people like me, people like some of you in the room, 
we do kind of believe that, you know, we have been gifted with the language that is spoken everywhere, that we can go around the world and everyone should speak to us in our language. But what we don't understand is this very important distinction. Transaction versus interaction. English as a global language is a language of transaction. People use it to buy things. People use it as a last resort. People use it in service. People don't care about nuance. People don't care about being polite. They simply want to be understood. They want to exchange money, and they want to get out of there. All other languages in that context are languages of interaction. Those are the languages you fall in love with people in. Those are the languages you dream in, the languages you express your feelings in, your aspirations. And of course, if you've never learned another language, as most people from my country haven't, how would you ever understand this distinction? As far as you're concerned, there's just English. And then there's people who interact with you, who are probably English and therefore nice, and people who just transact with you, who are generally foreigners, who have an accent, who make mistakes, and really aren't, you know, we just don't really like them. So we have another grenzer, the people who speak the same language as us, English, and the people who don't. And what the problem is, is that in the UK, we lack that empathy. We lack that understanding of what's actually going on when somebody is speaking English to you. We simply do not understand the sacrifice that you have to make when you speak a foreign language, and suddenly you have to choose your words, and you have to choose very carefully what you're going to say. What I think this really points to is, is this. I believe that we are all born in a box, and the world essentially looks like this. Lots of different boxes. Now, let's say that this box on the left is a very nice box, but that's the English-speaking box. And if all you ever do in your life is speak English, you can only talk to the people who are in that box. Equally over here, let's say we have the French-speaking box. Only the people, the, all the people in this box only speak French. And the fact is, these two boxes can never interact with each other. And then we have language learning. Then we have the people who look at the sides of the box, grab a rope, and start climbing up. And when you reach the top of that box and you look out over the world for the very first time, the world is a very different place to how you imagined it. That's how I felt that summer when I was eight years old, and for the very first time I found myself having a conversation in another language, when for the very first time I started hearing stories that I would never be told in English, and I started to develop a perspective on the world that was simply inaccessible to me as a sole English speaker, as it was to Amy's family, who left Greece with a bit of a sunburn and some nice memories, but not really having learnt very much. Good. Now, um, we'll come to that in a second. Now, I grew up in London, as I've said, and um, one of the things that I've always been most proud about, about living in London, is that I think it is a society where anyone can belong. One of the things that defines it is that nobody really belongs, so we all belong by default. And every day I would go to school on the Tube, and it was actually on the Tube that I started learning languages. If we talk about the how, it was the perfect gap in my day. It was about 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon where I could have regular contact with languages and make progress. But the other thing that would happen is that I would overhear the most wonderful conversations going on around me in all these bizarre languages, and I'd sit there and try and work out what it was. Are these people from Poland? Are these people from the Philippines? Are these people from Spain? What is this language they're speaking, and what are they talking about? That was my main motivation to learn, because I wanted to understand the people around me. And so gradually I started to learn the languages that I'd hear every day, and then I realized that everyone talks about more or less the same stuff. What are we having for dinner tonight? Did you turn off the oven? Have you got your key? And that kind of thing. But still, it was actually quite refreshing to know that this noise around me, as I gradually began to work out that it wasn't just noise, it was communication, it was language, was incredibly benign and exactly the kind of things that we would be talking about. And then let's introduce this man. This man is called Nigel Farage. This man has spent his life receiving a, a salary from the European Parliament and campaigning to destroy the European Union. And um, in 2014, he made headlines by saying that he felt awkward on a train because he heard foreign languages around him. He felt awkward because other people were speaking their own 
language. And it's quite interesting because when I was on a train and I heard other people speaking other languages, I couldn't have felt more at home. I felt so alive, I felt so excited. And I thought, why don't I speak their languages? But Nigel, they seem to have the opposite opinion of why don't they speak mine. Now at the time, this was 2014 when this story came out, and there was a lot of controversy around it. We were still in an era when we didn't really say things like this in public. We didn't talk about immigration in a negative light. We were a much more tolerant and outward looking society. But a few weeks after this story came out, I was on a bus in Oxford, and uh, there were two lovely Spanish ladies chatting away in Spanish on the bus. And after a while, an old man at the front of the bus got up, he walked to the back of the bus, went right up to their faces, held his fist out, and said, speak English, like this, right in their face. And of course, the two girls were absolutely horrified. They couldn't believe what was happening. I was horrified. I thought, has this really happened in the UK just after this? And gradually, ever since that moment, I think we've started to see a little bit of a shift. People seem to see languages as a bit more of a threat. The second example that I'd like to talk about is this, and unfortunately, I just have to go into YouTube here. This video, which also came out in 2014. Let's just watch it. For spacious skies, for tus olas de granos tambar, yo pishina tsakoti. So you baba na manga brutas, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. So I remember when I saw this video and I thought it was absolutely beautiful. I thought for the very first time I'm starting to see a representation of the world that I call mine. A world where people live together, a world where people speak different languages and a world where people share that diversity. And I'd like to say, I mean, my intention is not to do any publicity for Coca-Cola here. Sugary drinks are very bad for your teeth and the so-called sugar-free alternatives have widely been proven to be carcinogenic. Drink water. But they made this lovely video about languages, so I'll give them that minute. But when this video came out, what happened next was quite horrifying. It turned out the rest of the world didn't quite see things the way I did. It turned out that people were threatened by this beautiful video, threatened by this video of people speaking the languages they'd learned from their mothers, coming together and celebrating that diversity. To the extent that on Twitter, the hashtag Speak American began trending as people waded in on both sides. What is going on in the world? This was 2014, and I think that was really a year when there was an enormous shift and languages started to feel like the front line in a way. Languages were the very first thing that people noticed when, about someone being different. And it seemed to be a sort of badge of belonging, a badge of some kind of political identity. That was 2014. A couple of years later, this happened. We got these two people running the UK and the US. Theresa May on the right, who as Home Secretary, went around the country with vans advising immigrants to go home. And I won't say anything about the man on the left. But what happened? It's find it interesting that this started with language. This started with the fact that for some reason, speaking another language was threatening to other people. Not being able to speak my language, people took offense at it. But what I find really interesting about this is that why is it just the UK and the US that seem to have gone particularly in this direction? Now, remember we talked about boxes. In the English-speaking box, when this stuff was going on, we told ourselves a story. We in the UK said Brexit is the beginning. 
This year, Marine Le Pen will become the president of France. Gerd Wilders will win the election in Germany, in the Netherlands, sorry, Gaston. Um, <laughs> Alternative for Deutschland will win the elections in Germany, and before we know it, Brexit will look like nothing. That is the story we told ourselves to excuse the fact that we had voted to leave the European Union for very dubious reasons, and the fact that we were having problems internally. It turned out that none of those things happened. None of those things even came close to happening, and so far, we've not seen anything in the world as close to this, except in the two monolingual English-speaking countries, the United Kingdom and the United States. Is that a coincidence? I wonder. The rest of the world is becoming more multilingual. The rest of the world is learning languages. All over the place, people now understand the importance of climbing over the sides of those books, even if it's just learning English and looking out. People are, under, people are able to empathize with the idea of speaking a language non-natively, but in the UK and the US, we're going the other way. We're not learning languages. We feel emboldened about the fact that people are learning English. And I think the thought chain goes like this. People are learning English because English is better. Therefore, we are better. Therefore, we can do things like this. I'm very concerned. And I think as language learners, we do need to understand the importance of the time that we're in. So what can we do? We have to fight the Grenzen. We have to actually stand up and say that we want to live in a world where people speak other languages. We want to live in a world where we can move freely and where we can meet people from all over the world. What I would say that you have to do as people is, um, is well, well, you're already doing it. I'm talking to the converted, but you need to learn other people's languages. When you travel to another place, you need to show them that you respect their languages, you respect their culture, you think it's beautiful, and even if you can only say a few words, you're delighted to, because the reaction that you'll see will overwhelm you. And the other thing that we have to think about, especially at a conference like this, is not just how we speak to each other about these issues, but how we speak to the world. It's great that we can come together with like-minded people and share the joys of learning other languages, but we need to understand the fact that most people who aren't like us are committed to misunderstanding what we're here for. We need to find a way to positively express the color, the excitement, and the fun of living a life when you can speak to anyone everywhere, and we need to defend that. And therefore, by doing that, by making people understand that languages are important, languages are beautiful, and understand what people go through when they learn your language to speak to you, hopefully we can try and make the world a more compassionate and more tolerant place. I'm attempting to do that in some ways, but I'm not telling you that there's any easy ways, any easy answers. This book that I've just written from Amaret Tujal, Bizarre and Beautiful Words from Europe, for when English just won't do, is something that I sat down with my editor and discussed very, very carefully. And we said we need to capture that experience of speaking multiple languages, capture the joy of discovering a really exciting world and try and br word and bring, bring it to a larger audience. So this is what we've tried to do, and we've tried to do it with a bit of humor. Because as you know, all around, all around the world, languages don't translate directly from one into the other. There are gaps, there are nuances. Just the word Grenzen, for example, demonstrates how hard it is to, um, to translate things. And of course, the English language, which is largely seen by so many as being the best in the world, of course, has a lot of words missing. For example, this one. The German Handschuhschneebehaftballwerfer which is somebody who is such a wimp that they will only throw snowballs with gloves on. This is the kind of insult you can throw at someone. Full of color, full of life, full of cultural information. The pantofolaio in Italian, which literally means someone who sits around all day in their slippers doing nothing. What a beautiful image of just sitting there in your slippers doing nothing. And of course, especially for Gaston, the Dutch taalgenoot. This is somebody who is your language comrade, someone who actually speaks your language. And I find this word particularly interesting because we don't actually have a need for this word in English because everybody speaks English. Everybody is a taalgenote. But imagine if you do speak a language like Dutch and you eventually get tired of speaking all of these languages, all the, of speaking English all day, essentially, and you just want to turn to the person next to you and, and speak your own language. It's a concept that we just cannot get our heads around in an environment where we don't need to speak other languages. So a couple of conclusions from today. I think um, it's fair to say that the world is in a slightly difficult place. 
But I firmly believe that there are so many reasons to be optimistic. The fact that events like this can happen, organized entirely through the internet, where we can bring people together who otherwise would not have even crossed paths, is a cause for hope. The fact that so much information is available nowadays means that people are more informed than ever about the issues that really matter. And I think the fact that more people are learning languages than ever before is a cause for hope. We just have to make sure they learn the right ones, and we just have to make sure that global English doesn't take over. Global English should never replace the valuable and beautiful things that other languages are, that encapsulate other cultures and tells the stories of the people that speak them. So some concluding thoughts. What can you do? What can you do and I do and everybody else do to try and make the world a more multilingual and more tolerant place? Speak less English. It's wonderful, have you thought about it, that I can stand on this stage in the middle of Slovenia and deliver a talk in my native language and expect all of you to understand, and all of you feel like you should understand me, even though I've been speaking English my whole life by an accident of birth, and you've been learning for considerably less time. Every time you use English, you are handing an incredibly unfair advantage to people like me in the world who do not deserve it. People from the UK, the US, and other English-speaking countries simply do not deserve the leg up that you're giving us by allowing us to go everywhere speaking our language. Create less content in English. I've noticed there's a bit of a, a, a phase at the moment of people creating social media content in English because it looks cool because of hashtags and things like that. Do not do it. Use your own languages. Be proud of your own languages. Share your own languages with other people so that they understand what it is that you love about them. Consume less in English. This, would be the, this is an enormous thing. There are companies out there in the world, in fact, all companies, that would quite happily get rid of languages altogether. Because just think about it. If they didn't have to waste all of that money paying people like my colleagues to translate release notes and terms and conditions and advertising campaigns into all of the languages of the world, they would make a lot more money. The only way that you can reverse that is to demand multilingualism, demand the fact that they produce content for you in your languages, and that's what you want to consume it. Tell Netflix to produce more series in other languages. Tell Facebook to produce more um, information in other languages as well. The point is, we cannot allow English to become a default. We must have more languages which is that point. So just some concluding thoughts, really, because, as I said, we're talking about the why here. We're talking about why I learn languages, why I feel passionate about it, and why I strongly believe that in order to face a lot of the problems today, we need more tolerance and more compassion, and we can only get those things through language. And this is just a concluding thought. Learning languages is tough. It's difficult. Many times you want to give it up. And let's be honest, I don't do it for the irregular grammar. I don't do it for memorizing vocabulary. I don't do it for tables. I do it for the effect. I do it for the result. For me, learning another language is about climbing up the walls of the linguistic box that by chance I was born in and trying to get a sense of what the world is like for other people. For me, learning another language is that very special moment when you make a joke and the other person smiles. That's why we learn languages. And that's why we will always feel passionate about it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm from the UK as well. And so thanks for everything you've said. I read um, just before we came out to the conference in The Guardian that you're thinking of moving to Spain, but based on what you've said, I guess. Uh, I'm not thinking. I've got a one-way ticket. Oh, right. Well, I was going to ask you. I go on Thursday. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, was that the question? Well, I was going to ask you, actually, if, um, based on what you think, you're obviously going to be missed because you've hit the papers. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered what you thought of staying and fighting your cause still in England, really. 
Yeah, it's a good question. And I think um, some of the things that people have said since, I mean, first of all, I'm absolutely baffled that me leaving the UK is uh, interesting enough that The Guardian produces an article about it. I mean, what, what has happened to the world? Um, <laughs> But the fact is that the article did come out and it was the most read on The Guardian for about a day, which is even more baffling. And it has actually produced some interesting questions. And one of the things that people have asked me is, why are you leaving us? Why are you abandoning us? And I think, well, it's not really about that. You know, I think my feeling is the UK has made a decision to go in a very different direction to the one that it started in when I was growing up. And essentially, you're given a choice. Do you want to live in an environment where the idea of European unity is controversial, where the idea of kind of being tolerant about other languages is seen as something that we can discuss? I mean, I don't. I want to live in an environment where there are languages everywhere, where we respect other people, where people are welcome. And as I said, we don't have any Grenzen. The UK used to be that place, but I think the UK is going through some difficult times at the moment. And I think the most effective thing I can do is to say, look, this is what the UK is offering me. This is what the, other, the rest of the world is offering me. And I think I'll go with this one. But I wish you all the best with Brexit. Please let me know how it goes. Um, I'll try and come back if there are still flights. But thank you. One little question. Yesterday, in a little discussion after the conference, I suggested uh, make Latin as a standard language for international organizations like United Nations and so on. Do you think, do you think things would be better if Latin would be as a neutral language, a standard language for international organizations? Latin. Um. <laughs> Well, maybe that's the direction we're going in with the UK leaving the European Union. Maybe we are going all the way back to then. Um, no, I think um, I like the idea. I think it's nice to think that we can have a neutral language, but my issue with neutral languages, and I know a lot of you speak Esperanto, so please don't shout at me, but my own feeling about neutral languages is that it's more of a dream than a reality. The reality of having a language like Latin would still exclude an awful lot of people. I think the solution is what the European Union currently does, which is to prioritize multilingualism and have an enormous and extremely high-functioning interpreting department, which means that any European citizen can go to Brussels, receive information in their own language, speak their own language in the parliament, and be understood by everybody else. That's the world that I would love to see. Hello. It's close the question the, with the previous question. Then in a little romantic na borume na sinoithu mo kathena sti dikia tu glosa ke na mine hume mia kini tu laish tu yata taxidia mas. Is it not a little bit um, unrealistic for us all to be able to speak our own language and for everybody else to be able to understand us? Or romantic or romantic? Out yeah, of a book. The, romantico. That's what you said. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but listen, I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a politician. I'm not here to deal with pragmatics. What I'm here to deal with is aspirations. And I think we have to have dreams and we have to have principles. And if we all agree that these things are important, we can start to move towards a place where that thing becomes more of a reality. What I think is a huge problem is the idea that there's, there are hierarchies of languages. The idea that one language is more important than another and therefore receives more funding and more prioritization, which is an idea that we've really inherited from kind of hundreds of years ago with colonial times. English should not be prioritized over other languages. As I say, people like me should not be given a huge advantage in the world. And I think if we could try and increase understanding about that issue, we would move to a place where the world was more multilingual and more tolerant of other languages. Hi, I just wanted to say that I agree with you. But the thing is, it's very difficult to accomplish. And um, you say about producing content that is not in English, but you've published books that are in English. You are giving a speech that is in English. Do you tweet in English? So um, I think that, that the thing is that we prioritize English because it's globally understood. And the dream of uh, multinationalism and multilingualism is not going to be true, I mean, ever. If you want to have uh, an impact with what you're doing, whatever you're doing online, whether it's for your private purposes or for business, you can't, you can't do it in another language. You'd have to translate it and it um, uh, you would need much more time to produce the same content in like 10 languages, just publish it in English and it would be uh, understood. So how do you contribute to your dream? 
Thanks. No, you're absolutely right. Um, the only slight defense I can make is that English is my native language. And the fact that I am able to do all this stuff in my native language demonstrates the problem. You know, I have a huge advantage that many other people don't, and I think that's wrong. What I'm really trying to do is just raise awareness about the importance of other languages, because so many people believe that there is no need to speak other languages. We don't need to prioritize them. We don't need to fund them. For example, in, in my country, we, we are actually a multilingual country. We have Welsh, we have Gaelic, we have Irish, and the amount of effort that those speakers have to go to just to have signage in their own language, just to have visual recognition, is absolutely astonishing. I think the key to beginning to make a difference is to increase visibility. And I think that's what we have to do now. It's a long road ahead to try and live up to this dream that, as we've heard, is romantic, is unrealistic. And I agree with you, but what we can start doing is making languages more visible. Make other people realize that other languages are there and make people understand what having those other languages there means to the people that speak them. That's how we increase tolerance, that's how we increase empathy, and that's how in the long term we can live in a world where languages are much more equal than the current situation where it's English and then everything else, which makes me very unhappy, even as a native English speaker. Hi, I thought about your, your word, Grenzen, throughout this whole thing, and I think Yes, there are a lot of ways in which we do see these Grenzen as limits, and those, those Grenzen, those cultural Grenzen, the, the linguistic Grenzen, they're always going to be there. But if we think about the Grenzen not as the limit, but the other translation, the frontier, not the limit. It's someplace we want to explore, and we are, because we're here, language explorers, and I think that's the inspiration we can be to the people around us as a show. This is an exploration, and this is, we want to see what's on the other side of the Grenzen, and meet the people there, and that's just what we do, and show that to the people around us. Thank you very much. I think that's a wonderful comment, and I completely agree. Um, I just wanted to respond to the last comment. I was, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, what was your name? Joanna, all right. Um, I think that as far as publishing stuff in other languages go, that's like, it's really kind of almost a myth that's become reality that English speakers don't even need to work at perpetuating that, that like, English is the only language that we need that like you can get noticed in because now people grow up with this idea in their cultures that that um, if we want to be noticed outside of our country, if we want to like like pop singers singing in different languages and whatnot, and I think as long as I mean they're just all these other cult cultures are just kind of playing along with this, that it's never going to change. I mean, there's never going to be um, there's never going to be a shift that people are like, oh, okay, these languages are there and we want to, and there's like a use for learning them. And so I feel like, yes, I sympathize with the fact that like right now, yeah, it's very important um, if you want to be noticed to have things in English, but that can be changed if other cultures, um, yeah, decide to promote their languages too. And I also wanted to say, um, I think especially as far as multilingualism goes, like we really have to start like here more at the, at the conference, because like, I mean, people are speaking lots of languages, but there's still like an, an incredible amount of English like being spoken amongst everyone, and I feel like us native speakers, as English speakers sometimes, at least this might just be me, um, I feel like I'm almost like kind of imposing on other people, being like, yeah, I would like to speak other languages, but I mean, I don't want to like, you know, be like, okay, let's have this conversation in a different language. So I feel like, for example, um, the volunteers at the front desk, we have these name tags, we have different languages on them. You can see like, I mean, we don't have to default to English. You can see, okay, we have another common language. Um, so yeah, we don't need to just default to English. Thank so, you. Yeah. Let's hear for Alex, everyone. <laughs>